Hey everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today in economics, we are talking about pure monopolies, chapter 22. So some of the first questions we get are, what are the characteristics of monopolies, and then why do we study monopolies? So as a reminder, there is one seller in the industry. Uh, there is no close substitutes by its definition. There's only one seller, so there can't be a competitor there. Because of this, they are the price maker, the industry uh, decides the price as always but now there's only one firm in the industry so that one firm decides the price at least on the producer side of things there's blocked entry and they will um, work in non-price competition some stuff we're going to talk about today and then secondly why do we talk about it well for its own sake we're going to talk about it uh, but also to help us understand the more common market structures we need to talk about the extremes, pure competition and monopolies, before we can start talking about the in-betweens, which uh, happen far more often. Okay, so very quick overview, one seller in the industry, no close substitutes, price maker, blocked entry, and non-price competition. So non-price competition is when businesses have to compete without changing their prices. We're gonna see this a lot more in oligopolies. Even companies with standardized product like natural gas, electricity, they have to engage in public relations. And unfortunately, we've seen this a lot with PG&E with the recent fires uh, and other things that's been happening. Even products that are differentiated, like Windows has a bit of monopoly. You could definitely argue it is a monopoly, um, but they still need to update their consumers with the new updates, software, whatever the new thing is from them. So they still uh, work in non-price competition. That's just usually advertising. So why do monopolies exist? Well, barriers to entry is a big reason. So as a reminder, monopolies have the strongest barriers to entry. Oligopolies have still pretty high, but it's loose enough that one or two large companies can come in and compete. Monopolies competition is next. There's still some differentiated products, so you still can get some niche markets going. And then last, and the easiest to enter or exit, is pure competition. So why do these things exist? Why do monopolies exist? A big portion is the economies of scale concept. As a reminder, the economies of scale is the idea that the LRATC is downward sloping as you update or increase your fixed resources, you get the lower average total cost. Well, if there's only one firm that can do this and set up a whole bunch, then they're going to emerge. This is more typically true with natural monopolies like we talked about. So that's definitely one reason why somebody can become a monopoly is they're just more efficient with their fixed resources. Why else? Well, it could just be legal barriers, uh, government-assisted monopolies. Um, governments may create barriers through patents and licenses. Patents are the exclusive right of an inventor to use or allow another to use their innovation. Um, it used to protect the inventor, uh, the private property rights to make sure people are encouraged to continue to make new things. But if one person has, or one company has a really good idea, they could definitely become a monopoly in that until the patent runs its course. This is a reward for the efforts to create innovation continuing onwards. It does create monopolies in some cases, though. In the same way, it could be licensed. At the national level, the Federal Communications Commission licensed only so many radio and television stations in each geographic area. Um, and so if they don't give a license to everybody or only to one group, you can definitely see this. Uh, and they might do that in order to reduce overall costs, especially with natural monopolies, you might see this. So it can happen. In this way, the government uh, may limit the number of competitors. And so it could become a uh, monopoly, uh, government assisted. And so there would probably be some regulation going on there. And again, we're going to talk about in other sessions. And then it could also be that the monopolist simply owns uh, and has control over the whatever the resource is. For the example, the International Nickel Company of Canada back uh, in the day had 90% of the world's uh, known nickel in its reserves. So they simply owned the resource and therefore they were controlling of it. 
So even if Monopoly does not have the kinds of scale license patents or whatever else it is, they can still, if they're the largest, they can still slash their prices. Now, this does go into antitrust policy. They cannot go below their own costs and just eat uh, losses. That, that does break certain rules. But they can definitely go lower. They might have a larger ability to reduce prices. They may be having the largest margins. And so as soon as somebody tries to enter in, that new person has a lot of entry fees um, like advertising, making their name known, public relations that this company who's been around and has a name doesn't have. And so they can reduce their costs by simply reducing their costs and pushing the other person out. So again, it's another barrier that could definitely be happening. Or they could just step up their advertising so nobody ever hears about the other company. So the monopoly demand curve, again, three assumptions. One, they are a monopoly because of all these reasons and then maybe some more. We're going to assume it's a non-unit of government, uh, that they're not being regulated in any way. And that again, they're, they're a single price monopolist, uh, meaning they're not using price discrimination, which we will talk about later. What this means is that whatever the industry price is, and again, industry is going to be the producer and the consumer agreeing to the price, whatever that price is, that's going to be true for all the consumers. Even though it's going to be a downward sloping demand curve we're going to talk about, everybody faces the same price. So demand curve is the industry demand curve, uh, just like supply and demand back when we just had supply and demand. Uh, it's the entire industry's demand curve. So for that reason, it is downward sloping. Whereas in a pure competition, the industry's demand curve is downward sloping, but the firm's demand curve was horizontal because they were the price receiver. So here we have it. <clears throat> Because the demand curve is downward sloping, before we just had demand, but now we've added marginal revenue last chapter. Well, this is what it's going to look like. Our demand curve is going to be downward sloping, as you can see right here. It's the industry demand curve. But then mathematically, the marginal revenue is going to be less than the demand curve at every unit, except for the first unit, they will be equal. So you always draw kind of like this, a little angle like that. Now, monopolists also are going to set their prices in the elastic region of their demand curve. So let's break this down. Okay, so here we have our just a table. We've got our price and quantity and everything else. Let me go ahead and get a pen going on here. Okay, so we got our price and our quantity. So we're going to just like always multiply that across and get our total revenue. So 1 times 20, 20. 2 times 15, 30. 3 times 9, 27, and then 8. Average revenue, that will be total revenue divided by the quantity. So 20 divided by 1 is 20. 30 divided by 2 is 15. 27 divided by 3 is 9. 8 divided by 4 is 2. So what we notice is that my price, my average revenue, those are still the same. So we actually still have DARP if you remember that one. But let's check the margin revenue again. Margin revenue is change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity. Okay, so total revenue, we had a quantity of zero, we had a total revenue of zero. So zero change to 20 divided by one is 20. 20 change to 30 divided by one is 10. 30, divide, 30 change to 27 divided by one is negative three and then we find 27 changed to eight is going to be negative 19. so we see is for the first unit my margin revenue is still the same 20 20 20 20 20 so mathematically that will be the case but at the second unit i had a price of 15 and now my margin revenue is 10 and then nine and then negative three and the gap gets even larger and larger so why is this the case Remember, whatever the industry price is, 20, 15, 9, etc., all consumers pay that. So at first I sell my first unit, I get 20 bucks. Great. I sell my second unit. If I gained, let's say I have two people right here, person one, person two, 
I used to get $20 from that first person. Now I only get 15. So essentially I lost $5 in revenue from this first person because I don't get as much as I used to. And then what I gained, the second person gives me $15. That's the change I have. So I gained 15, but it took away $5. Interesting how I got 10. And then for the next round, I used to get $15 from each of these people, from person one and person two. Now I only get $9. So I lose $6 in revenue from each of them. And then my person three, brand new person three down here, I gain $9 from them. Now there's a, a sheet if you look at average revenue uh, greater than marginal revenue, or it might be called marginal revenue less than average revenue. It breaks this down further if you want, but this is the general reason why. You can see this mathematically. It's important to understand this because we would definitely use it going forward. So again, they're price makers. Since there's only one firm, they are the deciding factor on the producer side to this. So as before, the firm decided what they had to do, they are the price maker, whatever the industry said the price was, they had to accept. Now, the industry demand curve is the firm's demand curve. And so we have this downward slopingness. And like we saw, it's going to create the margin revenue is going to be less at all units, except for the first unit, they'll still be the same. So why do they set in the elastic region? Well, a couple assumptions. If we want to produce more units, we need to reduce our price. That's a law of demand. So we're still facing the industry demand curve. Elasticity, total revenue test is still true. If your price goes down, then your total revenue goes up. And if you're inelastic, if your price goes down, then your total revenue also goes down. So if the producer, if in this case the monopolist, wants to produce more units, that means they have to reduce their price. So would you rather have an increase in total revenue or a decrease in total revenue? An increase in total revenue. And it really is that simple as far as why they prefer to be in the elastic region. Remember, they want to sell more and more. So for the total revenue test is really the basis for this conversation. A monopolist will never choose a price or quantity combination where price reduction causes total revenue to decrease if they can help it. They'd rather stop at that point. We're still going to use profit maximizing, margin revenue equal to margin cost to figure these things out. Demand curve just looks a little bit differently. So for this reason, they always want to try and avoid the inelastic region because it would reduce their overall total revenue and probably we'd assume reduce her overall profit as well. So using the marginal revenue curve, how can you tell when it's happening? When are the elastic and inelastic regions? Well, if you remember this graph from earlier, long time ago when we talked about elasticity, if you remember when margin revenue is positive, right here, you're in the elastic region. That's what we'd actually find this to be. And again, the reason is based on the total revenue test. If this is my total revenue, I'll just kind of redraw a very quick demand curve up here. Just assume it's the same graph. Well, right here, again, my price is reducing. And as long as my margin revenue is positive, which would be from unit zero to unit, we'll say 25 right down here. So until 25, my margin revenue is positive, which means my total revenue has increased from the last one. So if your price goes down and your total revenue goes up, you're in the elastic region. So once your margin revenue gets negative, that's going to be when you're going to be down at this way. Your price is going to keep going down, but now your total revenue goes also down. So if they both go down, you're in the inelastic region. So the quick takeaway using margin revenue is if the marginal revenue is positive, you're in the elastic region. If your marginal revenue is negative, you're in the inelastic region. And last option is if you're zero, your margin revenue is zero, you are unit elastic. 
So some wrap-up questions, hopefully we got these, is you should be able to understand just the general characteristics of a monopoly. You should understand why March revenue is less than the demand curve, except at the first unit. And lastly, you should understand why monopolist price in the elastic region. All right, until next time, bye.